Welcome back. I'm Terry Burns, and this is some supplemental material for my course on the Monus Hieroglyphica of Dr. John D. But today, I'm going far south from Dee's England. We're going all the way to Egypt to Panopolis. And this is an introduction to some works of Zosimus of Panopolis. We actually will not be talking about Dee that much. We're going to be talking um, about the context needed to understand two works that are critical to understanding or to see the influence of this secret text D has, the Codex Marcianus Graecus 299. Now, those of you who have been taking my class know that it has been my contention that an educated humanist in D's era could understand the Monus Hieroglyphica through Theorem 20, especially someone interested in the things D is interested in, like ancient Greek work, since he's an expert in ancient Greek, especially Greek mathematics, and Kabbalah, Christian Kabbalah, as appropriated from the rabbinic tradition. But after you get to Theorem 20, it gets rather hard to understand, and you really need a teacher. Well, you really don't have one today, unless you want to count me, and I make no claims to understand this perfectly. So what has happened in the first 20 theorems, you recall, is D has, using his monad glyph, symbolically set up the creation of the universe in the first 10 theorems. And the, this Edenic paradise or golden age has fallen, and he works through that and works through world ages and other things for the next 10 theorems. Then after theorem 20, and it's 20 where the world ends and you get his vision of the apocalypse, after that, <clears throat> As someone still alive, you are, in effect, following an initiatory, initiatory path, basically going through the symbolic alchemical transformation one would go through in the afterlife, according to some merged view uh, lines of thought, and that's what happens in 21, 22, 23, and 24. Well, this is where the Codex Marcianus Graecus comes in because it's a very rare text. No average humanist, in even a very educated humanist in Dee's time, is going to know much about it unless someone introduces them to it. So what we're going to look at in this supplementary video is how the works of Zosimus of Panopolis in the Codex Marcianus connects to John Dee's Monus Hieroglyphica. Also, how it connects to angel magic, like the sort he later does with Edward Kelly, and how it connects to our modern idea of the path of initiation. We also, in doing that, really need to look at how much of Egyptian religious belief can we read into a kind of Greco-Roman Egyptian fusion brought into Renaissance alchemy. The answer to this when I was in graduate school was a simple none. A lot of the thought on that has changed. People make mistakes, and especially when you're dealing with old text, it's a real struggle for what's at the cutting edge to, to catch up to what scholars are doing. And in until recent times, there was also a, an almost total disconnect between what university scholars are doing and what esoteric scholars are doing. That's not, it's um, not really that way now, but it was to a much greater degree then. But again, this is supplementary material for my class, and it is probably of greatest interest to those of you who have read and understood through Theorem 20. Um, in Theorem 21, we've, we've talked about various things D does with his squiggles of the letter omega. Um, in Theorem 22, you're going to encounter this graphic. Um, what I am talking about here should help you understand that graphic, because if this looks to you, say, like a distillation apparatus, may, maybe, um, then consider what Zosima says in the next video we're looking at, which is his metaphorophysical alchemy on excellence, sometimes called on virtue, sometimes called the visions of Zosimus. And then you can also consider what Zosimus says in another text I'm going to talk about called On the Letter Omega, since D has been having lots of fun with the letter Omega. But that's enough about D for now, other than what of the things I am talking about are things that D could have known. So we're going to explore several questions in preparation for looking at Zosimus's vision of alchemical transformation. It's a metaphoric transformation. It's basically a description of what would be the path of initiation in if it were outpictured as physical alchemy in the time of Zosimus. And then we'll, we'll go on after that and look at the letter omega.
What we're doing in this video is just setting the context. We're going to review what the Codex Marcianus Graecus 299 is, how John Dee gets a copy, why is the city of Panopolis, which is contemporary Akmene, so important? Who is their patron god, Mean? Um, how might Mean relate to Osiris, Jesus, and the Greco-Egyptian Hebraic fusion that is going on in Panopolis in the early Common Era? And here, I have to say that while in modern times, for scholars, appropriation is a big no-no and in human relations it's just you know considered polite not to appropriate the views of others without citing them and so on that's not the case in the ancient world as you probably know well the romans for example um appropriate the almost the whole greek pantheon of gods and goddesses so now once we're in the common era the notion of there being a merger of Egyptian religious beliefs with Jewish and Christian religious beliefs and that and that not being any big deal is really no big deal. It's more modern people that this bothers, frankly. Um, so we also want to look in more detail at who is Zosimus of Panopolis. Why does someone like Dr. Shannon Grimes, for example, describe his alchemy as becoming gold? And I mentioned this text before in uh, a video I did on Isis the prophetess to her son Horus, which comes from the Codex Marcianus Graecus 299 also. So we want to look at what works of Zosimus influence the Western mystery tradition generally and John Dee specifically? And I'll partially answer this right now. In the Renaissance, the way they influence the Western mystery tradition is they influence John Dee, who influences Rosicrucianism, etc. In modern times, there's a lot more people who have become interested in them and have gotten excited about them. And I'll talk about that in a moment. We're also going to want to look at Zosimus's attitude towards the Book of Enoch. And just as a side note, you know, a generation ago, some people would say that despite John Dee and Kelly's Enochian work, where they're looking for an Adamic language, a first language spoken by Enoch to the angels that would predate Hebrew, despite that being part of Dee's sort of quest, there was um, a, an attitude of, well, you know, John Dee doesn't really know the Book of Enoch. He didn't have a copy of it in his library, for example, although we read many things that aren't in, the, in libraries. He didn't list the Codex Marcianus Graecus in his library either, uh, probably some of his Hebrew grammars, etc. But he certainly knew the Book of Enoch. Um, when he and Kelly were on their European adventure, they were at a place in Poland where the Hermetic Library in that time had a copy of the Book of Enoch. When he was in Paris, he was around people who had seen copies of parts of the Book of Enoch. But he also has this Codex Marcianus Graecus 299, where Zosimus, for example, and I'll show you an example, clearly knows the Book of Enoch and also has some other very interesting ideas about Christian and Jewish scripture. All right, so some things about Codex Marcianus Graecus 299. Um, it's a Byzantine manuscript. It's kept at the St. Mark or San Marco Library in Venice, which is where centuries ago Dee found a copy or made a copy. Um, Cardinal Bessarion brought it there or brought it to the Republic of Venice in 1463 from Constantinople, contemporary Istanbul, the literal meeting place of Asia and Europe, East and West, on the Bosphorus there. And Cardinal Bessarion donates it to the Republic of Venice. It is the earliest surviving alchemical manuscript. That's important. It's the earliest surviving alchemical manuscript. It dates to the 10th and 11th centuries, but most of the work in there is much older because the work in there, without exception that I am aware of anyway, are all copies of copies. The work that we talked about, Isis the prophetess to her son Horus, was first to third century of the Common Era. The work of Zosimus of Panopolis comes after that, but it's it appears to be before the fall of the Great Library of Alexandria. That's really early and really exciting, uh, because think of all the texts that were lost in that catastrophic loss of the Library of Alexandria. So John Dee makes himself a personal copy. Now, 
almost no one knows about this text, and we don't know how Dee found out about it, although we know when he got it, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But later, when it becomes more well-known, people like Carl Jung, for example, were fascinated about it. Jung's student, Marie de Franz, uh, was fascinated by it. In fact, she's the one, um, Marie von Franz, not de Franz, sorry, Marie, uh, was she was particularly interested in Isis the prophetess to her son, Horus, uh, but she was interested in the whole document. It, it's just so different. And you can see why Dee would keep it a copy, too. It would be a, a very heretical document. Um, also, there was a little bit of a, a attitude in the Renaissance, as you may know, about heresy. That is, if you're a common person and you do something heretical, you're really, you're really in trouble. If you are someone like Dee, you just have to have a person in a position of power who, who thinks it is okay and be quiet about it. All right, anyway, other things about the Codex Marcianus Graecus 299. It has the oldest known version of the Corpus Alchemisticum. It has, of course, Isis the prophetess to her son Horus. Um, it has... 17 works by Zosimus of Panopolis. Now, shout out to one of my friends who caught an error I made in an earlier video. I said it was the only source of the works of Zosimus. It's not the only source. It's D's only source. Um, there are some texts that are in Syriac that are attributed to Zosimus. One problem with those texts in the Greek fragments is determining whether he wrote them or not, though it it seems in most cases that he did, but the Codex Marcianus Graecus is the primary source. And as far as we know, Dee's only source. Dee was a genius, but as far as we know, he wasn't looking at Syriac fragments and things like that. There are other authors in here and look at some of these names. Uh, Cleopatra, this is in fact the page of the Chrysopoeia or gold making of Cleopatra that's in the Codex Marcianus. Elsewhere you find dialogues where Cleopatra is talking to, um, to people about this particular uh, diagram and her other thoughts about alchemy. But these are pseudo-texts. No one thinks that the last pharaoh, Cleopatra, actually drew this or that anyone made a copy of something that she drew or that she was really a participant in the dialogue attributed to her. The idea of these pseudo-texts is it's in the style of or according to the belief system of. We've talked about pseudo-Democritus text in this course, for example. And a lot of these texts are pseudo-texts. Look at some of these names. Kurotheus. That's just a combination of the Greek words for sacred and God. I mean, it might be someone's real name. Most people don't think so. Look down here. Agathodamon, the good demon. That's a real, Agathodamon is real problematic to begin with, but it's a pseudo text. In fact, as a character, Agathodamon is going to show up in Al uh, the alchemical vision of Zosimus on excellence that we're looking at in the next video. Anyway, um, as I've mentioned briefly before, in the late 1800s, Marceline Berthelot uh, translated some of Zosimus's text into French, and he also, as a wonderful gift to, her, to humanity, compiled them, working with Charles Emile Rule, into a collection of ancient alchemists. And what he did was had the, everything in the Codex Marcianus that he could read, and some other ancient Greek text also typeset in modern Greek, which makes them much, much easier to read if you can read Greek. Um, now, Berthelot makes some errors. He makes lots of errors. Old texts are very, very difficult to read, but they also get more and more difficult to read as time passes. So this was is just such a gift and it's all digitized now. I'll put a link to that at the end of this and I'll also drop a list of my sources in below. All right, so let's go ahead and review how John Dee winds up with a copy of this text and then what happens to it. Dee is traveling around in 1561 collecting Hebrew grammars. Um, he um, writes the next year his long lost only work on Kabbalah that title there would translate into something like a compendious table of Hebrew Kabbalah. Then he's in Switzerland, still collecting texts. He goes south, where he's been invited to the court of the Duke of Urbino. The Duke of Urbino is the head of the papal armies, and predictably the papal armies and 
other non-Christian armies are at war. This seems to be something that doesn't change a lot over hundreds of years and is quite tragic. What does the Duke of Urbino need? Well, someone who is an expert in mathematics, someone who is an expert in optics, and we have discussed when looking at D's sort of hidden level of conic sections um, in the hieroglyphic monad about how something like uh, knowledge of parabolas is very useful for ballistics and optics and that kind of thing. Anyway, D is staying there, and that is the only time in his life when it would have been possible for him, as far as we know, to get to Venice and copy this text. We don't know where he stayed in Venice, how long he was there. It certainly took more than a couple days to copy the Codex Marcianus by hand into Greek. I mean, it's in Greek, but to copy that uh, into um, D's manuscript, which is Greek in D's hand. Um, so the only time that D could have been there and copied it was 15 63. That's the year right before he writes the Monus Hieroglyphica. It is my unprovable contention that part of the um, intellectual and spiritual ferment that led to producing the Hieroglyphic Monad and led D also to revise his 120 aphorisms that is the Propoitamata Aphoristica was the combination of his interest in Christian Kabbalah on the one hand and then the Codex Marcianus on the other. Can't prove it, but boy, after studying the monad all these years, I can't come to much of a much other conclusion. Anyway, it's not till the 1580s that Dee and Kelly have their continental adventure that starts in England. They go through Poland. That's where they receive a lot of the Enochian calls. They go to Prague, the center of the Holy Roman Empire. Um, this is while England is preparing to go to war with Spain. The Spanish Armada sails. The Spanish Armada sinks and England wins. In 1589, D is heading home. And when he is heading home, he and Kelly part ways, for one thing. He does, D thinks he'll see Kelly again, but Kelly is, is becomes a golden knight in Bohemia. So D heads home, and in 1589, he leaves the Codex Marcianus Graecus 299 in what is today Hesse Castle on his way home. Why would he leave it there? Well, who knows, but I love to speculate, and the speculation here is easy. He's being hosted by the Landgrave there, and he needs all the help he can get to get home, frankly. He's worried about what will happen when he gets home, his library being destroyed, and so on. So he stays for a while there in, with the Landgrave, and he leaves a copy of the Monus Hieroglyphica, and he leaves his copy of the Codex Marcianus. Now, so it winds up in the library in Hessen. No less a literary light in Germany than Goethe himself looks at Dies Monus Hieroglyphica and the Codex Marcianus there. And I mean, we know that from Goethe's writing. I learned that from Agnes Klein's German translation of the Monus Hieroglyphica, but that's fascinating that Goethe is looking at these texts. But scholars, English language scholars, don't seem to realize it's there until the latter part of the last century when Roberts and Watson come up with a revised library catalog of D that has all the stuff D says is in, is in his library, but then all the books that have been found that have D's name in them found in other libraries, and this is one of them. It's wound up, it, it's come to light in this German library, and it's amazing Roberts and Watson found it. Maybe they read Goethe, who knows? But what um, another reason that it's not placed there is the dating makes no sense. It's listed as an entry um, into the library catalog there in uh, 1569. And then upon closer examination in recent years, that's, that seems that somebody just read, misread Dee's handwriting. It was 1589. Anyway, moving on. That's how John Dee gets a copy. Let's look at the, the distance this text traveled. Up here, this red star is Venice. England is off the map. So Venice is where Dee copies it. It comes from over here, Istanbul, a long way away. Um, it was Constantinople then. It was the literal meeting of East and West on the Bosphorus. Still is a meeting place of Asia and Europe. The text doesn't come from Istanbul, though. It's from all the way down here um, in Egypt and not the center of Greek uh, learning and culture, Alexandria, but down in Panopolis, which is if Alexandria 
was the center of Greek learning and culture in the beginning of the common era. One reason for that is that the last pharaohs were Greek, the Ptolemies were Greek. So the center of Greek language and culture isn't in Greece, it's in Northern Egypt, in Alexandria until the library is destroyed. But the center of alchemical learning is further south in Panopolis. And who knows if that's why the temple of Panopolis was destroyed, but it, it lasts a, a little less than a millennia longer than the library up in Alexandria. So if we zoom in on this closer and try to see where Panopolis or contemporary Akmin is, Akmin has been sort of absorbed by Sohag here, which is a large metropolitan area. Let's uh, look at that more closely. All right, if Akmin is here, Dendera and the Temple of Hathor is down here. That's important, not just because the Temple of Hathor is fascinating for its own sake. It's important because since the temple in Akmin was destroyed in the 13th century, what we know about temple practices there are largely inferred from what um, scholars, and at first this was mainly French scholars, um, studied about the Temple of Hathor at Dendera. This is also a really interesting area if you are interested in old texts generally. What's down here? Oh, that's where the Nag Hammadi text came from. And you can drive from one place to another in this area within a couple hours, um, faster than that if you're not following the speed limit. Okay, a little bit more background if you're interested in Panopolis. Here's a wonderful book by Peter Wilson. It's not actually a book by Peter Wilson as much as it is a collection of different texts, a kind of pastiche. But what he wants to do is give people a sense of this fusion of Panopolis. That name Panopolis means the city of Pan because their patron god Mean was considered by the Greeks to be Pan for reasons you'll see in a minute. Um, and so you have, as he puts it, the last champions of paganism coming up against Christianity, um, also up against Judaism. Also, there is this fusion of everything from Gnosticism, Greco-Egyptian religion, psychotropic rituals, and so on. Um, if you want to read poetry from there, um, here is Brill's companion to Nonus of Panopolis. If you read that, I'd get it by interlibrary loan because Brill charges a ridiculous amount for their texts. Um, but I mentioned Nanus for a particular reason. Nanus writes the oldest poem of antiquity. It's the same number of books as the Iliad and Odyssey combined. That's really long for a poem. Um, and that poem is about Dionysus. But the same poet writes another poem, a much shorter poem, about St. John, the Gospels of St. John. That's the kind of fusion that is going on there. It's, it's just a fascinating fusion. Also in my... Um, final list of references, I'll drop a link to this easily accessible uh, article by Marwa Hafez, if you're a Hafez, pardon me, Dr. Hafez. Um, it's basically a discussion of if you go to Akmin today, what of these ancient things can you still see? Okay, so let's talk about the god Mean. Uh, and by the way, I, I should point out I'm a John D. scholar. I'm not a scholar of these ancient texts. I'm just a fan. So I am heavily relying on the scholarship of other people all the way through here. And I'll let you know who I'm relying on um, as we go. And then also with a long list at the end. Anyway, Mean is the patron god of Panopolis, Akmin, also of the goldsmiths of Mean. And as the Isis and Osiris cult spreads throughout the Egyptian world, it tends to to um, assimilate or appropriate other gods and goddesses. So Mean plays the role, so to speak, of Osiris, um, who is the god of the underworld and a fertility god. Mean is also a fertility god. You can see why one might think Mean is a fertility god or associated with the Greek god Pan, right? He is what's called an ichthyphallic god, meaning that has a notable phallus, which is often knocked off on statues, but when not, usually Mean is holding his phallus in his left hand, if that is of interest to anyone. Um, 
Also, there is this whole story of the lettuce of Akmin. The idea is that the sap of the lettuce is basically the semen of Min because it's milk colored. The modern Egyptian city of Akmin, again, is the Roman settlement of Panopolis, which is a Greek name, but not the name, interestingly enough, that the Greeks used. Get to that in a minute. Ancient Egyptians called it Ipu or Apu, but the Greeks called it chemis, as in alchemy or chemistry. Um, it, they all come from the same root. It is very identified with alchemy. Also, textiles, statue making, and any of the arts that you would associate with those things, like making tinctures and dyes, for example. It's like many cities along the Nile. It's on the east of the Nile. Uh, funerary complexes would be on the west of the Nile because, as we'll talk about in a moment, that's where the sun sets in the west, right? And we are going to look briefly in a minute at some basic outlines of Egyptian, pan-Egyptian theology that would be evident in the writings of Zosimus. Okay, and as I already mentioned, it was destroyed in the 13th century. Oops, let me go back there. Okay, that's better. So I wanted to point out that in Zosimus's era, there are still priests of the Egyptian religion as well as Christian and Jews. There is a whole discussion about whether Zosimus was Christian or Jewish. He's a priest of the Egyptian religion, it would seem. So I'm not that interested in that question because the way I think one might address it instead is noticing that in his writing, he's very respectful of all these religions and sometimes he treats them as exactly the same thing. And so that is just part of the fusion of what is going on. And, and one of, frankly, it's why I like it so much. It's that all these ideas have been merged together. You know, the sun god Ra can be looked at as the god of the Christians and Jews because Egypt has by this time long been monotheistic. Jesus was a Jew. So in this ferment, they all become different facets of the same thing in a certain sense. And certainly that's the sense Zosimus is writing in. By the way, some people speculate that the later alchemical text Turbo Philosophorum, which I've also talked about previously, is uh, that the authors were from Panopolis, but it's from a later time in Panopolis. In the Turbo Philosophorum, this is an Arabic text that is talking about Greek philosophers, and then it's translated in the Renaissance into Latin. And angels are appearing where you wouldn't expect them. One of the things you notice in the Turbo Philosophorum is that the way that angels are described matches the contemporary religious sense of Muslims, Christians, and Jews, the Abrahamic faiths, whereas that's not really the case exactly in the works of Zosimus of Panopolis, and I'm going to talk about that more in just a moment here. But what else do we need to understand to look at his processes of alchemical transformation or his work generally? Well, one of the things Grimes points out in her work is that you really have to understand a bit about Egyptian theology, of course, since it seems possible he's a priest, and the rituals of statue making, because those are rooted in ancient temple traditions. And although alchemy is later described and often made fun of as, you know, puffers trying to change lead into gold, Grimes points out that there is no strong evidence for that at all in the Greco-Egyptian alchemical corpus. Even in the Chrysopoeia of Cleopatra, and Chrysopoeia means gold making, well, Cleopatra was a pharaoh. The pharaohs, as part of the embalming mummification process, go through a ritual that is also referred to by Zosimus, the opening of the mouth, and then they go through the underworld. And if they are successful, they become one with Ra and become gold. And when the sun rises, then they're one with Ra. That is the sun coming up in the east, traveling for 12 hours across the sky, setting in the west, and the gods die and go through the underworld. And this re repeats every day. So that's what is meant by gold making. It's God making. Okay, another thing that Grimes points out is that in Panopolis, the scribal priests of what is called the House of Life um, keep the ancient libraries. There is evidence that Zosimus was, along with being a craftsman, that he was a scribal priest. He must have been a rather um, good craftsman, a high rank, because only senior artisans 
master craftsmen become priests, and then they are teachers of teachers. Look at this next thing here. Who is the patron god of the house of life? Both, who is by this time totally merged with the Greek Hermes. Remember, we've been talking about Hermetic texts. The, the monad glyph itself has Dee's London symbol of Hermes. He's constantly paraphrasing and alluding to Hermes Trismegistus in the Emerald Tablet. So, of course, in looking at this, um, when there are references to Hermes and Thoth in the text of Zosimus, and there are a lot of them, you can imagine that someone like Dee would, take, would pay attention. Now, in Egyptian temples, not just in Panopolis, the microcosm represents the macrocosm. The quintessential work on this is Schwaller de Lubitz's tome, The Temple of Man, where uh, Schwaller is looking at everything from sacred geometry to in the architecture, how it corresponds to the human body, all kinds of things. Does D know this? Of course not. I'm just mentioning it because I thought you might be interested in it. It's a great book. There is not a lot of evidence about the priestly activities of the House of Life because everything was destroyed. So Grimes is leaning on work done on Dendera's nearby House of Gold, particularly by Philippe Duchesne, who um, she quotes a lot, but also um, people like Michelle Mertens, who translated everything into French. In Dendera's House of Gold, again, the purpose of the House of Gold is not to turn everything into gold. It is to attain gold of spirit. Now, let's talk about gold making and God making and how they connect with each other. Um, so, Philip Duchesne, the person I just mentioned, according to Grimes, talks about how his work on the House of Gold at the Temple of Hathor is pertinent to the studies of alchemy. And she talks about this temple, which has ascending and descending staircases. Um, oh, in the work we're going to analyze, the number of stairs and what they represent will be important. Anyway, there are ascending and descending staircases that lead to the roof of the temple. The entrance to a goldsmith's atelier or workshop or House of Gold is located on a landing off of the stairway and lower ranking artisans are forbidden to enter this room. Why? Because it's where initiated priests put the finishing touches on cult statues and they perform the opening of the mouth ceremonies. If you know about opening of the mouth ceremonies where you've probably heard them discussed is in uh, mummification practices that when a pharaoh is mummified, for example, then there is an idea that during a 12 hour process called the 12 gates, oh, there's an alchemical work named that, several of them. Uh, anyway, the, the pharaohs Ba and Ka merge and that happens after the opening of the mouth, which renders the pharaoh able to speak again and speak to the gods. And to eventually, if everything works out okay, become, one with Ra near the in I mean, this goes on for, for centuries. Uh, so statue making priests do the same thing with the statues. The idea then is to open the mouth of the statue to receive the presence of God. So there is a indwelling presence of God in these statues that the priests have worked upon. So the house of gold is where these rituals of God making occur. The statue making is in effect God making because you're filling the statue with divine presence through the ritual of the opening of the mouth. In his study, Duchesne speculates that alchemy might have stemmed from those practices. Grimes agrees with Duchesne, and I agree with Grimes, who knows far more about this than I do. Zosimus's religious work focuses almost exclusively on methods for realizing the divine presence within the material world and within oneself. His allegory of the alchemical opus on excellence contains several allusions to the opening of the mouth rituals used in both statue making and embalming rites, and he likens the process of coloring a metal gold to the process of becoming enlightened. All right. There we go. Now, let's see what else we need to know about the context of Zosimus here. Well, one thing we need I need to remind you of is that Zosimus writes 
after the ISIS to her son Horace letter, likely before the fall of the library at Alexandria. And how do we know that? That's because at places he refers to the library in present tense. Now, I suppose it's possible that the library might have fallen and he's in Panopolis and didn't know about it, but not very likely. For one thing, we know from other parts of his works that he's traveled around a lot. He's been to Rome and so on. But also, the fall of the Library of Alexandria is such a culturally traumatic moment that word of it spreads really, really fast. So he is probably writing before the fall of that library since he refers to it in present tense. He talks about daemons as well as good and bad angels. Um, he has very opinionated ideas about both. King Solomon, he portrays as a magician conjuring angels and, angels and demons. Now, have you heard that before? If you've studied Solomonic magic at all, you've heard of that before. It's a common portrayal in antiquity. Also, this is where I want to point out uh, something about the portrayal of angels. I said it was different in the works of Zosimus. Yes, it is. Zosimus is writing in Greek, and the word, Greek word angelos just means messenger. Hermes, in that sense, is an angel. He's not necessarily a, a Christian or Jewish or Muslim angel, but he's a messenger. So when you get statements like that it's easier to talk to angels than, than to the gods, well, that's because they're messengers. It's just saying it's easier to talk to the messengers than the gods. Messengers are supposed to be good at speaking. Anyway, and he is a scribal priest um, in a group. Uh, the equivalent we might use is a guild whose patron god is Hermes Thoth a messenger who is associated with magic and alchemy. The Zosimus texts show clear knowledge of the Book of Enoch, including the Book of Watchers. At one point in a work addressed to Theosebia on 10, he explicitly says this. We're going to look at that in the very next slide. So the alchemy of Zosimus, which we're going to look at right after the comments on the Book of Enoch, appears to be physical alchemy. And he is definitely... Um, accurately describing some metallurgical procedures, at least according to uh, Oxford Museum curator and historian Sherwood Taylor, and I'm not going to argue with someone like that. But its purpose is spiritual purification. He's not interested in changing lead into gold, even though there are multiple metallurgical references. Now, you saw something like this, if you recall, the Isis the prophetess to her son Horus letter there, that after Isis is merging with this, um, what appears to be a, a Hebrew angel, Omniel, which is interesting in and of itself that the goddess is merging with this Hebrew archangel, then learning the secret of alchemy. Then she merges with her son in the afterlife, her son who used to be her husband, who she is in effect perhaps helping reincarnate. And then she's going to tell him the secret of alchemy and you're kind of holding your breath like, what is it? And then she launches into mundane metallurgical recipes. Well, the same kind of thing happens in Zosimus, not once, but many times. Um, okay, we also find references in Zosimus to the first real human that we know was an alchemist. Maria, sometimes called Maria the Jewish, sometimes called Maria the Hebrew, sometimes called Maria the prophetess, like Isis the prophetess. Um, and if you want to know more about this fascinating person, I would recommend Raphael Pattaya's incredible book, The Jewish Alchemist, it will, will tell you everything you want to know about that, although it's also the basis for a lot of scholarship since then. Okay, now let's talk about the Book of Enoch. Here, just for some eye candy, is uh, the third leaf of one that is uh, at the University of Michigan and part of the Book of Enoch. But here is one of the things that Zosima says to Theosebia in a work called On Ten. Theosebia, by the way, he writes lots of letters to. He refers to her as a sister. It's pretty clear he doesn't mean biological sister. It's as if they are brother and sister in some group of priests. And so anyway, this is what Zosima says on your screen there. The holy writings, madam, say that there is a race of daemons who have intercourse with women and lead them. Hermes also mentions them in his book on natural things, and the entire book offers a meaning, both manifest and hidden. This work of Hermes, sadly, is lost. Um, Zosimus refers to a lot of works of Hermes that are lost. 
it's not out of the question that even though they're pseudo Hermes that they probably existed because remember Hermes is the patron god of the of the scribes. So Hermes mentions it in these terms. The ancient and divine books say that certain angels were taken with passion for women. They descended to earth and taught them all the works of nature. It is about them, these angels and demons or demons, that our book says that those who became proud were driven from heaven because they had taught to men all things evil, which do not serve the soul. The scriptures also say that from them the giants were born. So the story is that the fallen angels but remember, Zosimus is just is reading angels as messengers. And the angels basically rape human women, but then they teach them things like sorcery, spells, how to use plants for medicine, how to conjure with the sun, moon, planets, and stars. They teach them metallurgy, jewelry making, music, how to make things we'd associate with alchemy, like tinctures, dyes, cosmetics, how to use particular precious stones, all kinds of things like that. And this might or might not be why in these early CE Al Greco-Egyptian alchemical texts, you see so many women. Isis is an alchemist. Cleopatra is an alchemist. And the first real human alchemist is Maria. And Zosimus is here writing to his sister, Theosebia. His attitude towards these angels is really ambiguous. As Grimes argues in more detail in her book, he seems to prefer Omniel to the angels of the book of Enoch. Well, that's nice. I mean, rape is a horrible thing. Many of the alchemists he refers to, like I said, are women. In fact, he really refers to more women than men in these texts that we have, or it seems that way to me. Okay, so some very basic things about Egyptian beliefs. These are super basic, but without knowing them, a lot of what we're talking about will not make sense. So remember, in New Kingdom Egyptian thought, the gods create a new world every day, as I've already said. The sun's journey from rising in the east and setting in the west is a birth, death, and rebirth of Ra the sun god, and the sun itself. Funerary complexes tend to be on the west side of the Nile because that's where the sun goes down and the gods die. Also, cardinal directions are much easier to determine. The closer you are to the equator, this is very near the equator. The sun is also very bright in the desert. And Egypt um, at that time is essentially desert with this north-south strip, which is the Nile. And all of the the for the fertility brought by the Nile. So the sun comes up in the morning in the east. It's blindingly bright. The sky turns red, then gold. I mean, it, it's, it's easy to see how this symbolism directly connects to the physical world around you. It sets in the west as the sun again turns the sky red. Okay, so... That is something that you need to keep in mind. What you have here on the screen are some pictures of Ra on the solar bark on the daily voyage across the sky. These are just public domain Wikipedia uh, pictures, by the way. I, um, and down here, you see Ra going through the underworld, the subterranean Nile, um, traveling at night, preparing to be reborn. You can also see from these pictures on the screen how gods assimilate one another in this time period. In that lower left picture, you have the ram-headed version of Ra. Over here, you have Ra Harakte, a combined, a combination of Horus and Ra. And um, I've already talked about how Mean assimilates the function of Osiris, who after death becomes Horus and is the guide through the underworld um, in, and that is depicted on the walls of the, the tombs of the pharaohs. So the 12 gates of the afterlife, the Amdwat, that which is the underworld, is written on many pharaohs' tombs. I'm not jumping into the whole argument about whether the tomb is more than a tomb. I mean, you can have the tomb be more than a tomb, but this is verifiably on 
the walls of many Pharaoh's tombs. It tells the story of the sun god Ra from the time when the sun sets in the west and rises in the east. The dead Pharaoh takes the same journey, ultimately to become one with Ra and live forever. The 12 gates take 12 hours. It's preceded by a ceremony I've already mentioned called the opening of the mouth. After that, um, there is a voyage on the subterranean Nile. There are things that you may have learned about elsewhere, maybe even partaken in rituals representing or reenacting this, like um, a battle with the serpent Apep or questions by the 42 assessors, having the heart weighed by Mott, and it has to be light as a feather. And if all of those things happen, one continues to the temple of Osiris. And then eventually, as in sometimes it's called the golden scarab comes up in the east, the Pharaoh merges with Ra and becomes the morning sun. I mean, it's beautiful. And we talked about back in Theorem 18, how the Egyptians tended to equate that golden scarab with Jesus. That's the solution to understanding the riddle in Theorem 18 of the hieroglyphic monad is you have to make the scarab Jesus. All right, what else um, do we want to say about this? I think we will just go on for now. Oh, I know what I wanted to say about this. All of these things don't require the reading of hieroglyphs. No, people in Dee's time couldn't read hieroglyphs. And when everyone was really excited that someone was explaining him, I'm thinking of the hieroglyphica of Hor Apollo in this sense. Hor Apollo uh, claimed to be a Coptic priest from the 6th or 7th centuries and is explaining, say, what the Eye of Ra means or, or different hieroglyphs like that. And it's it's funny reading now, but we all know it's wrong. Europeans could not read Egyptian hieroglyphs until the Rosetta Stone. That's a couple centuries, three centuries actually after D. So no, no one can read hieroglyphs in Europe in D's time or before. And it's it's really questionable whether they could in the time of Zosimus, or Apollo is is coming a couple centuries after Zosimus. But People still know the stories, and not only that, the stories are written in other languages, like in Heretic text or in Syriac or in Greek. Um, they still know the basic outlines of the symbolism involved and can write about it in a way that Europeans of these time who are interested, which admittedly is a very small rarefied group of European humanists, but they know the, uh, some basic symbolism associated with raw Isis, Osiris, Nephthys, Horus, maybe even the 72 assessors, Mott, scribal priests copy the sacred stories. So not knowing these basic things I'm talking about here would be kind of like, well, there are a lot of Christians who don't read the Bible, who, who can't read it or who just don't. But it would be really weird if one of those Christians was sort of sketchy on who Jesus was. It's like, well, yeah, he's a guy in there and I know he's important, but I don't really know what he does. I mean, you, you can have oral knowledge of a thing. And in this case, you don't even need the oral knowledge of the thing because it's written down. It's just not written down in hieroglyphics. That's a, a really important point. So. Anyway, I've talked about how when the deceased pharaoh enters the eastern horizon, an hour 12, that pharaoh has, if all is successful, merged with Ra and become the morning sun. In some texts, he's become the golden scarab. Jesus becomes referred to as a scarab, and we talked about that back in Theorem 18. Okay, here is a, uh, a copy that is almost a millennium before Zosimus. I mean, these practices went on for centuries um, with the uh, Book of the Amduan. This is from Luxor, which was Thebes. Now, you can't read this, I don't think. If you maybe if you can, that's awesome. Please let me be your student. But if you know the story, you still probably can recognize, oh, maybe, maybe that's uh, the boat of Ra, maybe that's a solar bark, maybe this, maybe this is Apep. Hmm, I'm not sure. We should be able to find some scales in here, shouldn't we? And find Mott and so on. And then you can find, like I said, this written out in other texts that aren't hieroglyphic. The gods create the world anew every day, sunrise to sunset. And Zosimus explicitly sees this as a divine study of transformation. And he describes it alchemically to create gold of spirit, not gold of matter. And that's what we are going to see in his vision. So 
We're about to the end here. If you're ready to see how a likely temple priest and a scribe would adapt those ideas into a vision that describes the transformation of the soul. We'll talk about that in the next video, part two of this series on Zosimus, on his work on excellence, sometimes called on virtue, sometimes called vision so of Zosimus. It's his vision of alchemical transformation. And these various sources I've talked about here, since, as I said, I'm, I'm a fan of this scholarship. This is not my area of expertise. I've pasted all of this below. So let's go on and look at the vision of Zosimus on excellence. See you then. Bye-bye.